Hi, LA Progressive friends. We are delighted to bring our old friend and colleague from the now from the East Coast, Peter Larvin, Larman, Reverend Peter Larman, who has contributed articles every so often to the LA Progressive. How are you doing, Peter? I'm doing great. It's wonderful to see you. So recently, your most recent article is titled uh, Ukrainians Yes, Palestinians No. It's about the double standard. So we can't ship enough money to Ukraine, although we don't really ship it there, uh, to fight off the Russians. And, 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 we, and at the same time, we can't send enough money to Israel to uh, murder, what is it, 35,000 Palestinians at this time? Uh, what, what gives with that? But before, before Peter answers that question, I'm sorry, Peter. <laughs> I just want to say it's great to see you. Dick and I have known uh, Peter for many years when he lived in Southern California. And initially we met uh, because you were representing, I believe it was uh, Progressive Christians United. So it's it's great to see you. And it's great that you have continued to contribute your articles to the LA Progressive. You um, help us to shine a light on so many areas that mainstream media does not. So go ahead and answer your, answer Dick's question if you can remember it. Uh, no, I'm gonna answer it actually keying off our friendship and working relationship in Southern California because we specifically met in a project called Justice Not Jails about the carceral system in America and specifically in in uh, Los Angeles County. And uh, it's no great jump to say that the situation of Palestinians now for 75 years has been one of mass incarceration, uh, subjugation, uh, uh, othering, and uh, humiliation. And to my way of thinking, the thing that breaks my heart, and it really breaks my heart, this is not for many of us, and I know for you, it's not a head thing, it's a heart thing, it's a spiritual thing. Um, there should be no exceptions to the rule of human rights anywhere around the globe. There, there should be no population, especially one that suffered as long as the Palestinian people have, no population that is... Um, unsafe at all times, um, that experiences uh, uh, expropriation at every turn. That's the theft of, as I said in my article, the theft of land, the theft of water, the theft of, of, of dignity. The people now who are contained in Rafah in southern Gaza, you know, are uh, dying of, of uh, starvation and disease as much as from bombardment. Now, that has happened in human history at various times, but nobody thought that that would be happening now. And of course, uh, the weapons that are falling and the, the capacity of the IDF to do this is entirely supported by our country. This is uh, uh, at some point in the piece I wrote, uh, I point out that, um, uh, you know, uh, Biden may be somewhat powerless in terms of, uh, because of Republicans in Congress, in terms of support for Ukraine. He is not powerless in terms of uh, Israel. That's right. Uh, I mean, isn't it true that without our support, Netanyahu would not be able to do what he's doing? He gone tomorrow. He would be gone tomorrow. I mean, it's just crystal clear. And Israeli, thank God there are faithful witnesses in Israel, Israeli Jews, Israeli Arabs, who are reporting up close how thoroughly corrupt um, uh, Netanyahu's regime is, how people want to see him out. The voices for peace inside Israel are remarkably bold, considering they're subject to persecution. Right? I mean, serious persecution. Uh, the, that's the other thing. The Israeli democracy has become a kind of police state um, in, in this wartime mode. I wanted to say, though, about the Palestinians, to my way of thinking, there's no possibility for peace if you continue to heap humiliation on people. And again, in terms of our, our domestic mass incarceration thing, uh, James Gilligan uh, was the director of corrections for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts maybe 30 years ago. I got to know him and his wife. His wife was the famous feminist writer at Harvard. Uh, but James Gilligan's writings were about, hum about this, the core of violent behavior lies in humiliation and prisons and the the whole prison uh, the whole uh, criminal justice system 
in our country rests on humiliation. Well, the Palestinian people have been humiliated and they're a dignified people. And so you can kill 100,000 people, you can kill 200,000 people, that, and, that, and the number may go there, you know, the way things are hanging. Um, you're not going to, this is not going to end, you know, the, as the Israelis like to say, the ex existential threat. It's going to multiply it. So Israel will finally pass into the status of a total pariah state. Does anybody want that? I, I just, it makes my head, it just makes my head explode. Enough, I've answered the thing. Yeah, no, that, that, that's good. Although I would say that we, we uh, you, you talk about the provocation for attacks. We have essentially decimated our Native American population. I mean, it's possible Israel could level uh Palestine. It it certainly seems that they are there. There's nothing stopping Netanyahu from wanting to do that, uh, and and we don't seem to have the will. We can't blame it all on one guy, Joe Biden. It's our country. It's being done in our name, and we don't seem to have the will to stop it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go into in some depth, and and I know that uh, many friends of Israel, including friends of mine can't stand it when we talk about the settler colonial mode. And the reason people say they refuse that uh, framing is they say, well, this is not, we're not South Africa, we're not the United States, we have ancestral claims there. Um, well, um, you know, the, the uh, I'm a minister, so I'm familiar with the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, I mean, all this stuff about Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho and God gave gave us the land and so forth. Uh, archaeologists, including Israeli archaeologists, cast tremendous doubt on that narrative. It's it's like uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's the foundation of a national uh, mythology. It's not history, uh, uh, which is not to say there weren't Jewish people living uh, in Palestine during the time of the British Mandate, for example, and and all through the through the uh, 20th century up until now, there were uh, people living there. But the idea that um, this is ours because God says so is exactly what the Puritans and the uh, European settlers of North America said, because God says so. In fact, they call themselves the New Israel, right? Um, the the in uh, New England. So there the the parallels are eerie, really eerie in terms of what Native Americans experience. And yeah, there's, there's as Dick, you say, I think they're showing there's no limit to the cruelty. Yeah. There's no limit. There's no limit to what they're willing, willing to do. And it's all based on the fact that we were attacked, understandably. But think about, uh, even Biden says this, the United States was attacked on 911. We blundered our way into catastrophic wars as a consequence of that, and we are still reaping the whirlwind of just busting up Iraq the way we did. Nobody learns. I mean, nobody seems to learn. And some of the, these are some of the smartest people in the world, but nobody learns. I'm wondering. For Biden now, you know, you're, you're. I, I think you're going to segue into Michigan for Biden now. Uh, not to change course uh, and fairly drastically will cost him re-election. And then people say, well, of course, that's our fault or that's the fault of listen to Michigan, the people who voted non-committed, you know, uncommitted, they should fall into line. When when are people expected to completely stifle their conscience and get in line to elect a president who is permitting on his watch this kind of slaughter and... Um, and does nothing. So, you know, you say, when will we learn? And I'm wondering, we tend, our discourse seems to focus entirely on the pretextual reasons that the United States uh, continues to support Israel. Um, this business of, you were talking about you being a minister and um, why Israel became Israel in the first place. That's pretextual. We all know it's strategic and it has everything to do with the waterways and the pathways and getting oil and oil tankers um, out of that region efficiently and quickly and having a strategic position for United States military 
to protect those uh, waterways, which is why when Yemen um, and the, the Houthis started to uh, attack the tankers, immediately the United States rushed in Whereas with the when the Palestinians were being bombed, there's no support for them. There's no hope for them except for us, uh, our, our finger waving, because this is really about making money, uh, making the wealthy even wealthier. It is, and I uh, again, I uh, my way of approaching things like this is often through the lens of history. So. It's really, really very clear from, and I've done a lot of extra reading on this uh, recently based on this crisis, the British uh, mandate the, the, and, the, and the Balfour period and so forth, it's no uh, coincidence, of course, that happened after World War I, but at that point, petroleum was already on everybody's minds. I think about uh, uh, the period... The, of the 1910s, 13s, 14s, you know, John D. Rockefeller was consolidating his empire. Uh, the uh, uh, Aramco, the foundations of Aramco were being laid there. Uh, so yes, of course, that's true. Uh, Israel has been a kind of strategic hog for the United States for a long, long time. And they've been happy to be that, to, you know, bask in unbelievable amounts of uh, armament and uh, strategic uh, uh, support. And I think part of the problem with the Biden people is they're so used to that framework and they've got so much else in their mind that they're like, oh no, could this blow up in, in our faces? Well, it just did. So uh, you're a long time dyed in the wool, very active activist. And people like the three of us and a lot of people we know are, are are heartbroken, as you've expressed, about what's going on in Palestine and, and, and Gaza. And we can write articles, beautiful articles like yours. We can sign petitions. We can send emails. What else are you doing there in Providence uh, about what's going on in Gaza? Well, the students uh, uh, nearby uh, at Brown University have been through hell and back over this. Uh, they've called for, and by the way, the it's an interesting coalition of people with backgrounds in the Middle East, but a tremendous number of American Jews, progressive American Jews, who are really the most um, organized uh, group there. And they need support from friends. I mean, I happen to be an alumnus. That's not why I live here. But um, uh, to say uh, to the administration, wait a minute, you're treating these people like terrorists because they... Uh, because they, you know, disrupted a meeting of the corporation, asking for some consideration of divestment. The university has said, and like many universities, they have said, "Well, we did divest from fossil fuels, but that's different. This is political, right?" And this, you know, it's it's transparently clear that this has to do with donors. It has to do with, uh, including trustees of the university who who are saying you cannot. Uh, you cannot permit these voices to to uh, go after Israeli policy like this. It's just not. It's just impermissible. Um, and so, um, yeah, support activities, uh, uh, helping them think through peaceful, nonviolent, but you know, ongoing nonviolent stuff. But you know, uh, a lot of these kids are going to go go to trial. They might uh, lose their well. They might you know lose their freedom, and and lose their ability to. Uh, to be uh, students. The other thing is, I don't have good relationships with, we only have two representatives and two senators from this tiny state. I don't have good relationships with all of them, but I certainly am, am saying to them, hey, remember me? I, I'm not alone here. Um, it, but it's frustrating because it's limited. It's it's limited. I have not been arrested myself. Maybe I should, maybe I should submit to arrest at some point, you know, you know, the old expression, if not now, when? Um, but the, the White House has to hear this. The White House has to hear this. I think, I think honestly, the the uh, listen to Michigan thing isn't going to stop in Michigan. It's going to spread like wildfire, right? And sending money to that effort and supporting that, uh, 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 you know, the the idea, by the way, I find this incredibly offensive. Well, you're, you're allowing... Trump to step in in this case, right? If you weaken Biden, you're allowing Trump to step in. Wait a minute, 
who's weakening Biden if not Biden? Right. By carrying on in this fashion, by throwing away part of his part of part of a, a key part of his coalition. Younger people, people of color, you don't have to be up to speed on Middle Eastern politics uh, to know that people are dying, children are dying, and uh, and the White House, you know, it's on the way, it's on the White House's door. So the name of your article that you so graciously submitted to the LA Progressive is Ukrainians, yes, Palestinians, no. Obviously, in both cases, the military industrial complex wins. But let's talk about the uh, topsy-turvy moral universe and how um, for the Ukrainians, yeah, we're all there to support them, but the Palestinians, no. Let's, let's switch on to the Ukrainian question. Well, I have a lot of friends uh, on the left uh, who, you know, gently guided me for that framing because they said, well, does that mean you're all in on the Ukraine thing? And I said, no, I have questions about that too. This is a, uh, you know, a rhetorical device as a writer, uh, uh, but it doesn't mean that I'm an uncritical um, uh, fan of U.S. policy uh, confronting Russia. Uh, and, and again, you always have to say, doesn't mean that I'm on the side of Vladimir Putin. He's a murderer. He's a criminal. Uh, it's just what are we doing there as we push all these countries into NATO? If we were Putin, let's let's do a thought exercise. If we were Putin and we saw Finland, all these you know frontline countries getting you know U.S. arms, nuclear arms, right, right there, wouldn't wouldn't I feel a little bit encircled? Also. I say this and people don't want to hear it, but from a Russian point of view, Ukraine is part of Russia, right? It's not it's not an invention of the Soviet times. It goes way back, you know, to the 14th century. Um, it, who wrote the great gate of Kiev? Mussorgsky, right? Pictures had an exhibition, a Russian writer. I mean, Ukraine, Russia. Uh, uh, the Ukrainians suffered terribly during uh, the famine of the 1930s, uh, when you know uh, millions of Ukrainians were liquidated by Stalin, that doesn't mean that Ukraine, from a again from a Russian point of view, is not properly part of uh, Russia. And lots of countries make claims. Now, again, it was an unprovoked attack. Broadly speaking, I think the I think the. NATO countries and the United States need to respond, but it's almost as though the United States, and by United States, I mean the military industrial complex, fearing decline, has decided to flex muscle all over the place, Central Europe, China Strait, South China Sea, right, um, and the Middle East, all at once. And it's like, I dare you, um, should we be afraid? About a about a about our country being uh, so uh, bellicose, I think is the technical term. So bellicose on so many fronts at one time. I believe if you talked, if you had a glass of bourbon and we're talking to some of our senior military people, you know, in private, they would say they're scared shivers. Yeah, and I think the answer to your question, yes, indeed. I mean, we have eight hundred bases in countries around the world. You, you didn't mention Africa. We have bases in, in every country in Africa, and, and eventually there's going to be a reason to, to, to have some kind of battle there. Um, but but, but are, 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 is the military industrial capitalist, capitalists afraid, or are they raking it in? I mean, well, they're, they're not disappointed that we're, we're spending billions of dollars in Ukraine and sending billions of dollars to... to Israel, they would only be upset if we were sending food and medical supplies and healthcare workers to the Palestinians, because there's no profit in that. I think it's both things, Dick. I really do. I think uh, uh, I'll use the old term, big capital, big capitalists, generally speaking, are not stupid people. Right. Um, and they understand the terrible risks for the world, even for even for them, in reckless strategies, they will pursue them for profit, as you say. They will pursue them. I mean, think about extractive industries uh, and uh, and the death of the planet. Um, 
the people doing this uh, know what's going to happen. I mean, we know that you know Exxon's known for decades exactly what was what was going to happen. Um, but they push themselves because greed. Yes, greed is a is probably the supreme force. Um, uh, and you know the only way they can be stopped. We know this is is uh, from the bottom. I I go back. It sounds like I'm um, in deep despair here, and I am in despair around uh, Gaza. But I also go back to the way that uh, nobody thought that this apartheid regime could be taken down, and then and then it was. We have you know we have to remember that nonviolent action is a force more powerful. If there's enough of it going on, uh, and each day when I wake up, I try to remind myself that humanity has risen to the occasion in past times, and I I see humanity around the globe um, taking this issue of the Palestinians very very seriously. It was wonderful to see South Africa. It was, a, it was the, exactly the right country prepare the perfect oh, case yes. for the yes. for the high court in the Hague. Um, thank you thank you for reminding um Peter thank you for reminding us of that because there are times when we feel uh, a sense of despair. Uh, Dick and I talk about how when we were growing up everybody smoked even your medical doctor smoked. Right. And you know the tobacco industry had so much power. But we can take these industries down and you're absolutely right. We've done it in the past and we can do it again. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen in our lifetimes. But the passage from here to there is going to be rocky. And um, you know, again, I I think, and I say this to my fellow, uh, you know, faith leaders, you've got a job here, and your job is to uh, understand how to respond to people in tumult. Um, Lots and lots of people in high anxiety about this, about the about the mass murder. Either uh, go into a rage that's so red hot that they're not, they can't think straight, or they numb down and cease to function. Well, that's a. I don't want to oversimplify this, but uh, friendship and. Uh, some spiritual nurture is useful in a time in a time like this, and to be reminded, particularly for the younger people, to re be reminded um, that yeah, you are the ancestors hold you up, right? Uh, all the people who who walked before you. I am uh, I'm having these discussions with my fellow uh, people in the National Council of Elders. We talk about the onslaught of fascism here and there, certainly uh, in many of the the uh, state legislatures now, there's no question that, that the, you know, an outright fascism, Tennessee, Florida, uh, is beginning to prevail. The people of color, particularly the old line civil rights leaders in the Council of Elders, always say, well, you know, I grew up in fascism. I grew up in, you know, Mississippi back in the day. And, and it is possible to continue to function under fascism even. It's a chilling thought, but I think we need to be prepared. And I think religious leaders need to prepare. So speaking of spiritual nurturing, this again was spiritual nurturing, just like all those trips we used to take down to Pastor John Cager's uh, Ward AME Church and work with you on Justice Not Jails. That was then a highlight of, of our lives. It was. And, and I'm is. glad because me too. And I still talk to John all the time, right? And uh, and uh, find out what's going on in California. He gives me all the poop about the <laughs> DA race and you know the the, the ins and outs. It's uh, it's impossible to uh, to keep up. But you are part of a crucial media environment out there, right? Um, We're still making those connections. Every day. <laughs> I know you are, and 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 you're and you know you're podcasting. You're doing it all. Yeah. We are. You almost make it look easy, but I know it's not easy, and I bless you, really. Thank you. Well, so, so as Sharon reminded me this morning when I was feeling stressed because we got a lot of things on our places, well, we, we don't actually have to do any of them. You know, that's a nice thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We don't. So, But we're blessed that we are able to participate in the ways that we participate, and we're really blessed that there are people like you. Um, who contribute to our platform. And we thank you, Peter. Uh, we know that you are rushing off to another event. Thank you for joining us this morning. 
And we look forward to talking to you again soon. Onward with love. Thank you.